self-blame and self-hatred. We're going to recast this episode because I think this is one of the really difficult things, of course, for parents to hear and to know how to manage. What do you do when you're trying to help your child deal with their anxiety, their depression, their, when they're struggling socially, and they come back and say, I hate myself, I'm terrible, nobody likes me. Oh my gosh, does that not break our hearts as parents? So that's what this episode is about, how to help your child when they turn that anger and that frustration on themselves. I know that a lot of kids do this. And what's interesting about it is that you have a child who, in many circumstances, will turn immediately to, I'm terrible, I'm awful, I suck, you must not love me. And this can show up when they make a mistake. It can show up when they perceive that you are criticizing them in some way or they perceive that anybody's criticizing them in some way. It's very hard sometimes for them to take direction or instruction. And it can be a little perfectionistic for sure. But I think what we really want to talk about is how do you help your child interrupt this pattern because it becomes really frustrating for parents. Welcome to Fluster Clucks with Lynn Lyons, where we talk about a family's anxiety and other big feelings. Serious stuff without being too serious. I'm your co-host Robin, and I'm Lynn's sister-in-law, and I'm here to ask your questions. And I'm Lynn Lyons. I'm an anxiety expert, speaker, mom, and author, and I've been a therapist for over 30 years. Parenting can be a Fluster Clucks, and I'm here to help you find your way, and I'll even tell you what to say. Hey, Lynn, we have a great listener question for you to answer today. And it's on a topic that has come up before, but I think parents, when they deal with this, think they're the only ones. Mm -hmm. Self-blame and self-loathing. Yeah. This question that we had, one of the things that the mom said is that she didn't know that other kids do this. So that, of course, caught my attention. Let me give you a simple example. You tell your six-year-old to set the table. You're trying to teach them how to set the table. They reverse the fork in the knife or something. And you say, oh, good job, buddy. But remember, the fork goes on this side and the knife goes on this side. And then they completely go into that place of like, you hate me or I'm terrible. I can't do anything right. And I'm awful. And then the parent is like, this is such a huge dramatic reaction just because I told you to switch the fork in the knife. And I see this a lot in my practice. I've had plenty of kids and families come in where, for example, they're trying to help their parent do something. Maybe they knock over their drink, drop their ice cream cone. They need a correction on their homework. So they're trying to learn how to do their multiplication tables. And the parent says, what's seven times eight? And they say, 54. And you go, nope, 56. And they're like, ah, and they just, I'm terrible. I'll never figure this out. And it just becomes so confusing to parents. I think that's the thing that happens is parents feel really confused. They feel sort of like, where's this coming from? And they are very concerned. They'll say, he has horrible self-esteem. That's how the parent interprets it. How early can this pattern show up? I see it starting in probably five, six, seven So it's not necessarily a preschooler thing. It's the early elementary years. Yeah. It's harder in preschool because they don't have that much self-awareness and they don't have the vocabulary. might be that if you correct them, they might just start to cry, but they don't articulate these really sort of scary things that parents hear, like you hate yourself or you think I don't love you or you're a loser. Preschoolers don't articulate that as much, but once they start getting into grade school, that's when we start to hear it. Mm Mm-hmm. And also, since we have listeners who might be on the catastrophizing side of things, Mm -hmm. what's the difference between someone who has this pattern and then someone, a child who might say this once or twice? How do you distinguish when this is a pattern versus it's a one-off? And that's a good point because it is okay every once in a while for kids to say this and, oh, I'm terrible or, oh, I suck or, oh, nobody likes me. And oftentimes it's during times of distress. And so it happens. And so every time that you hear this language, you don't have to freak out like, oh, what's wrong with my kid? When it's a pattern, here's what you will notice as a parent is that you begin to brace yourself. It's such a pattern 
that, oh gosh, somebody's going to correct my child or you recognize they've made a mistake or they just drop their milk or whatever. You're expecting it. You know it's going to happen and you're sort of bracing yourself. That's when it becomes a pattern. You're just hearing it over and over and over again. And what often happens is then the parent jumps in right away to try and make them feel better, of course, and goes into this explanation like, oh, it's totally fine that you spilled your milk or everybody makes mistakes or they didn't say that or of course your coach is going to correct you because that's his job or you're not supposed to know your multiplication. So you go immediately into this explanation where you try and reassure, you try and correct the situation, you get into the content of it and you get into this debate. So the debate becomes, I suck. No, you don't. You don't love me. Yes, I do. I'm terrible. No, you're not. And that's not really going to be all that helpful, as I'm sure parents who struggle with this or have experienced this, that sort of debate doesn't really get you anywhere. You made a comment about self-esteem. And over the years, I've heard you not have the best opinion about that concept. So Mm -hmm. maybe this is a great time to So what is it about self-esteem that you think we're on the wrong track when we're pursuing it? So I think self-esteem is a good thing, right? I'm not like anti-self-esteem, but it's just the way that the language is used. So, So where it went off track is that it became, in my field, a goal is that every child should have great self-esteem, and it became this global thing. Parents will come to me and they'll say, I really need to increase my child's self-esteem. And I say, well, what does that mean? And then they're like, um, I'm not sure. It's just this sort of vague, mushy, psychobabbly term that I don't like. It's the same thing that happens with confidence, actually. I want kids to feel like they know on the inside that they are loved, that they are worthy, that they have wonderful strengths and resources, and that when things happen, they can handle it. So for me, confidence is not that you believe that everything will go right or that you can handle everything, but that you have the confidence inside or the esteem inside to know that when life throws things at you, that you can adjust, not that you're not going to feel good all the time, because I think that's where self-esteem got a little wonky is that it was like, well, I have to feel good about myself all the time. And then that causes problems. It's okay. If you do something that was hurtful, if you are learning how to be respectful, if you're learning how to be kind, if you're learning how to share, if you're learning how to fill in the blank, it's okay when you screw something up or as you're learning that you take a little hit for that. You know, you take a little, oh oh gosh, I shouldn't have done that. That's how you learn how to apologize and take accountability. Where it gets extreme on one side or the other is when you say, A child should have good self-esteem, so they should always feel great about themselves. That's a problem. That's a narcissist in training. Or you say, my child, whenever they make the tiniest little mistake or whenever anybody corrects them, they completely fall apart and just go at themselves. Well, that's where it's interesting because the parents seeing this as a self-esteem issue, but you would unpack that dynamic completely differently. It has to deal with perfectionism. It has to deal with so many things within the anxiety camp. Right. Now I get it. It's just like a generic umbrella term that really isn't helpful at getting to the root of the issue. Right. Because I'm always looking, what's the pattern that we have to change? Or the emotional skill to develop. Correct. And so when we're looking at perfectionism, I mean, this is really about rigidity, isn't it? That this child has such a big reaction these all or nothing reactions that things have to go a certain way. We want to develop in kids a huge range of emotional responses and emotional vocabulary and emotional responses. If the response is always big and dramatic and catastrophic, then we have to help kids learn to figure out the difference between how am I feeling about this? What's the difference between I feel a little upset and I feel absolutely devastated. What's the difference between being really disappointed and, okay, well, it didn't go the way we wanted it to go, so we can adjust. Life is, is full of these huge degrees of emotional responses, and we want to give kids that versatility. We want to give them the range to experience things. For example, if... 
I was a little child and accidentally kicked over my mom's coffee and it got on the rug. That's a bummer, but it's not this huge disaster. But if you're a child and you do something to somebody else on purpose that causes them physical harm, then we want you to have a different emotional response to that. And it's really that versatility in helping them figure that out. Well, let's dive in. I'm going to read the listener question now. Okay. My nine-year-old son has been to counseling. We were told that his concerning behavior is most likely due to anxiety. How do you help a child who won't talk about their internal struggles, but when tired, stressed, and any negative feelings turns them on himself with the mantra, I suck. Today, he said that his love for himself diminishes every time he is upset with himself, and my love must be like that as well. Any mistake, and mostly small ones, are over-dramatized and turned on himself. Help. And we'll be right back with Lynn's answer. Thrive Market is my go-to for all my grocery and household essentials and my pantry items. And I love the convenience of getting it all shipped to my house. It's a huge time saver. And I save money on every single order. I save over 30% with each. They have a deals page. So you can go through and find the brands that you love. They have a price match guarantee. They have over 70 filters that you can go through when you're looking for gluten-free snacks or non-toxic cleaning essentials, which I just love. You can create your own shopping experience with the click of a button. Join Thrive Market today and get 30% off your first order. Plus get a $60 free gift. So go to thrivemarket.com slash flusterclucks for 30% off your first order plus that free $60 gift. That's T-H-R-I-V-E market.com slash flusterclucks. Thrivemarket.com slash flusterclucks. We encourage our listeners to really help recenter self-care for themselves. And I think one of the things that is a challenge if you are a working parent is finding the time for therapy. I love the fact that you can now, using Talkspace, have access to online therapists and online psychiatrists to work around the schedule that you have. Oftentimes people wait too long because they think, well, there has to be some really big issue or I have to get to this place where I'm actually not functioning. Therapy is really helpful to help you figure out daily, regular struggles that you're having. And also it's so preventative. Having somebody that helps you look at your decision making, your problem solving, your relationships, your communication, all of that is a part of our daily existence as a human being. At Talkspace.com, you can sign up online and get a personalized match with a therapist in less than 48 hours. And you don't have any commutes to appointments because you can do them securely from your phone or your laptop around your schedule. It's affordable and it's in network with most major insurers. So as a listener of this podcast, you'll get $80 off your first month with Talkspace when you go to Talkspace.com slash Fluster. To match with a licensed therapist today, go to Talkspace.com slash Fluster to get $80 off your first month. That's Talkspace.com slash Fluster fluster. Higher education is one of the largest investments people make in their lives. And yet most people enter into that investment with a really incomplete picture of the risks involved. Student loan debt is a big deal right now, but you don't have to be one of the people who gets overwhelmed by the process and by the debt. Thanks to David S. Shuttler's new book, Graduate Debt-Free, Escaping the Student Loan Matrix. In Graduate Debt Free, Shuttler combines the warmth and the empathy of a concerned parent with years of meticulous research into every facet of education financing. Graduate Debt Free offers accessible and practical insights on how selecting a major can influence one's ability to pay off the loans, also the substantially overlooked cost of housing and life on campus, and also the viability of scholarships, community colleges, military service, and other avenues to reduce reducing debt while gaining an education. It looks at things that we forget to look at, doesn't it? This book is an absolute must-read for high school students who aspire to become college-educated 
while minimizing debt. Visit graduate-debt-free.com and take the first step to securing a debt-free education by picking up your copy at Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and wherever you buy your books. That's graduate-debt-free.com. Such a great question from this mom, because how painful is it that your child says, every time I make a mistake, my love for myself diminishes, and so your love for me must diminish as well. So there's two things we want to go after with this. The other thing that the mom said is that not able to talk about their internal struggles, which means not able to express what's going on inside of them emotionally. So if I were working with this family, that would be what I would go after first. I would probably make a list of all the different feelings that we could come up with. People say, oh, well, I'm mad or I'm sad or I'm happy. Let's see if we can get this nine-year-old to really expand his emotional vocabulary. And we want to talk about what are examples in which this would be a situation where this emotion might come up. What would be a situation in which you might feel this? What would be a situation when you might feel this? Now, say you've got a child who's just saying, I don't know, I don't know. Remember, I've probably said this a gazillion times, I don't know is a really instructive answer to me because it means that's where the gap is. So when you're talking to a child and saying, what are you feeling about this or what's going on inside of you? And they say, I don't know, that's where you want to work. And so you give stories, you give examples. You know, there are shows that they watch on TV. There's books that they read. There are situations. You become an observer with your child. And you help them develop a strong emotional vocabulary. You can use yourself as an example. I often give the homework assignment of what's the unexpected thing that happened during the day and how did you handle it? We might shift this a little bit and we might say, give me two emotions you felt today and tell me what caused those emotions. What do you think? So he begins to talk about it. And you model that around the dinner table. So you've got the parents modeling it, other siblings modeling it. You also want to be really direct about the fact that this is a pattern that he does. As I said earlier, instead of getting too into a debate about whether or not you love him or you don't love him, you want to say to him, it really seems to me that when you are having big feelings, when you are feeling tired or stressed, or when you're overwhelmed by something, You go right to those comments, don't you? That's the place that you go. So let's work on talking about what you're feeling and how you're managing it. And I want you to know right now that this has become kind of a habit for you, hasn't it? That right away you go to that beating yourself up. Now, is it rigid? Yes. Do we often see this with kids with perfectionism? Yes. What we want to do is just create more versatile reactions. That's what the mom wants to talk to her son about. Not get into the disturbing things that this kid says. You know, I suck. No, you don't. We want to say, oh, so there's that pattern again. What do you think you're feeling right now? Because we know that's the way it shows up. Is that when you feel blank, that's what shows up. Let's talk about what you're feeling. If you're that mom and you're trying to create more flexible responses. Might responses in other areas that aren't so volatile be a good place to really dig in? Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. What examples might that be? Well, when we're talking about having versatile emotional reactions, we also want to include the positive ones. So instead of just talking about, oh, I was really disappointed or I was really frustrated or I was really mad, we can also talk about like, oh, I was overjoyed, right? I was euphoric or, yeah, that was kind of fun or I felt a little content or that was enjoyable. You know, we went out to dinner and we had this meal. What would be the adjectives that would describe the feelings you had about this meal? It was fantastic, right? Oh, it was okay. You know, my French fries were fine. You can use all sorts of situations where you're, you're not all or nothing because that's the problem with this. So you can talk about, oh, I was a little bit disappointed or that made me kind of sad or when I was watching this, it was kind of funny, but then I watched this other thing and I was laughing so hard that I couldn't even breathe. You're really showing a range of experiences. 
Let me throw out an idea and you tell me if it's terrible or not. (laughs) Okay. So if I'm this mom and I'm hearing you, an idea that's coming into my mind is that if I made a sheet with like what you just said, here's a series of positive and negative reactions, Mm -hmm. but they're all different. And you say, we're going to make a game out of this. You always want to go and you point to this really extreme negative one, Mm -hmm. but you only get to use that one once a day. How can you make sure that you use all these reactions every day and you only get to use them once and fill in the blank? And so it's getting an awareness that there are so many ways to choose how to respond. It's a great idea. And that becomes sort of like you can make an emotional bingo card. Exactly. No, that's a great idea. One thing I would say is I wouldn't say you have to have all these emotions every day, but instead of just going to those very consistent ones, we want to change the reaction. I love that idea. Yeah, you make an emotional bingo card and you make it kind of a game that you play. And you also can observe those emotions in other people. Say you have an emotional bingo card and when did you see disappointment? When did you see anger as well as when did you feel disappointment or anger? Yeah, that's a fabulous idea. This is why literature is so wonderful that if you're reading a book, if you're reading Charlotte's Web, if you're reading The Hunger Games, which middle schoolers are so attracted to, it's because the emotions in that are so powerful. And so if you're reading things with kids and you're talking to them about all the different varieties of emotions, it's okay for them to feel powerful emotions that are both negative and positive. So we always want to make sure that when we're talking to kids about their emotions, that we don't want to go to the place of you're supposed to be happy. This is what we were talking about in the episode that we did with Inside Out and Turning Red, is how do we create an emotional jambalaya Leaving a space for sadness, leaving a space for joy, leaving a space for all of them. Because when parents come so hard down on them, we just want you to be happy. Mm -hmm. We're denying them access to that full emotional spectrum. Yeah. And that, that phrase, right? Oh, I just want my child to be happy. So I will say to parents, what I want your child to be able to do is to handle a range of emotions and express them and recognize that they're real and normal and that they can get through them. You had mentioned Hunger Games, but a nine-year-old is a little too young for Hunger Games. Yeah. But I mean, that's what we were talking about in last week's episode. When as a family, you're watching something, just use the story that you're watching Mm -hmm. to bring up an example and just say, you can use these emotions on your bingo card. So what emotions and reactions are you seeing in this movie? And you can use those to check them off. Exactly. The other thing, too, it reminds me as you're talking about that, Robin, is that I have worked with a lot of kids that have a very difficult time watching powerful emotions in movies or even in a book. So they won't watch a movie if somebody has strong emotions. It's funny you say that when my daughter was tiny and I would take her friends to go see, you know, like the current animated movie. My daughter was very chill, no matter like what was going on, but her two adorable (laughs) best friends, a dramatic emotion would come on and both of them would just stand up. That was their reaction. (laughs) So I'd be sitting there and I would watch both of them just stand up with their fists clenched. Yeah, that is so cute. I can totally picture that because I think a lot of little kids do that, even if they're watching at home or watching in the movie theater. Yeah, they're just feeling that emotion. So they stand up you notice that your child has a really hard time tolerating any kind of big emotion. I've had kids that they will not go to movies at all because they're afraid that they're going to feel something during the movie. And we really want to pay attention to that. That's actually pretty common. So what for parents listening, what do you do? Sort of the same thing is that we really want to talk about that, how they can handle different emotions. We want to expose them. There are a lot of children's books that really deal with different emotions. I tend to like children's books that don't say like, today we're going to be sad, but tell a story so that they can talk through it. So it's the very same thing is that how do we increase that? And it really is okay to give your kids permission, to give them the language, to give them the understanding that big emotions feel big and that difficult emotions feel difficult. And it's okay for them to feel them 
as kids start to get older, and this is where I mentioned the Hunger Games, what we can see in kids that as they move into maybe 9, 10, 11, and then into the middle school years is they start to even crave those big emotions Mm -hmm. because they're feeling very emotional too. So they will be drawn to things that make them feel big emotions. I've mentioned this on in our first season. I remember an episode we talked about this, but in my household growing up, it was totally the everybody be happy, just keep on smiling, accentuate the positive, the Bing Crosby Anderson sisters. That was our family mantra. Mm -hmm. I know that by the time I got to my middle school years, as a result of that, I was so obsessed with darkness and sadness. (laughs) I had my mini goth years because I wasn't allowed to express that sadness for so long. So I totally wanted to listen to the Smiths, Mm -hmm. you know? (laughs) Yeah. Nine Inch Nails. The thing that's interesting to me and sort of when you think about this mom saying, oh, their child always goes to this one place. It's just about expanding how it is that we tolerate emotions right? How we tolerate emotions. And I talk to a lot of teenagers about that in terms of anxiety. I've got one that she will say, I mean, we've been working on this for a while and she will say, I have to be able to tolerate my discomfort. I have to be able to tolerate my anxiety. She's fearful of a lot of things. She's fearful of her emotions. She's fearful of physical symptoms. She's very somatic and paying attention to her body. And she knows, she says, my job is to tolerate feeling these things that don't feel good, that don't feel comfortable. It was interesting with Harry Potter, too, reading the books with my kids when they were little. There are really big emotions in Harry Potter. There are strong things that those kids are experiencing. And you look at how mesmerized kids are by this. It's just really about adults saying that it's okay for us to feel those emotions. It's okay for us to talk about those emotions. This is somewhat timely. I saw a Twitter post shortly after our episode on using the Pixar movies for conversations that promote emotional literacy. Mm -hmm. Someone said, I've spent the day Googling Disney movies that aren't sad, so I know what to watch with my kids. I wanted to post our episode in response. (laughs) I didn't. So here's the thing. That's a very common parental instinct. Mm -hmm. I want to protect my kids from this sadness. It's very likely that there is a combination of the parent wanting to curate emotional experiences that their children can see Mm -hmm. and then difficulties with a range of emotions in the family. Absolutely. Yeah. It's interesting. I think of this little boy that I was working with a while ago and his dad was dying of cancer. And if you asked him the place that he loved being the most, he said it was when he went to cancer camp, which was being with a whole bunch of other kids whose parents were also dying or had recently died of cancer. And I said, why did you love being there? He said, because All of our feelings were allowed. Yeah. Right? It was just so, so powerful because he had been around. Everybody was so afraid to talk to him about it, that it was so sad. They were worrying about him. Mom did such a good job being on top of that and brought him to see me. And he went to cancer camp. And this little boy was just articulating something so powerful he was saying, let me feel my feelings and let me see that they're okay to feel. From this mom's question to thinking about the Pixar movies to thinking about, you know, saying, oh, we have to be happy all the time. It really is about opening up a range of emotional experiences and saying to kids, it's really okay that you feel that and helping them have a range of experiences emotionally. They're drawn to it. They're going to move toward it. We want to help them curate that for sure. We're going to take a break. But when we get back, there's a postscript to this question that is going to really amuse Lynn. I love my EarthBreeze laundry detergent. I don't know why liquidless 
laundry detergent wasn't a thing before now, but I'm so glad that it is. I also love it. It really, really works. So I work out. Well, I love that the packaging is lightweight. It's biodegradable. No more lugging those ridiculously heavy plastic jugs that never truly get recycled. It's such a better choice for the earth. Switch from the old-fashioned goo to something new. Right now, our listeners can subscribe to EarthBreeze and save 40%. So go to earthbreeze.com slash flusterclux to get started. That's earthbreeze.com slash flusterclux for 40% off. earthbreeze.com slash flusterclux. Hey, everybody. This is Robin at Flusterclux. When Lynn and I are not having a great time recording our podcast on the weekends, I have a day job. I have a travel magazine for families. So if you're thinking about a 2023 family vacation, don't plan anything without reading our guides to the best Disney hotels, the best way to get a Disney guide for less, and everything you need to know about booking a Disney cruise. Lux Recess has been since 2014 the go-to place for parents to read about luxury travel with honest reviews written for parents by parents. Check it out. The links are in the show notes for our best guides to Florida travel for your spring break in 2023. That's LuxRecess.com. L-U-X-E-R-E-C-E-S-S.com. Okay, Lynn, so here's the postscript. I deeply appreciate hearing that this is not uncommon. I have yet to find another parent in the same boat. Okay, let me just say, it's a very crowded boat, Mom. It's a really crowded boat. You're not alone in this. Okay, go ahead, Robin. Sorry. The therapist instructed my son to let out his emotions like pretending he had lasers to shoot his anger. They did not give us a plan. (sighs) Ah, gonna sigh like that. Yeah. I don't don't know why you would (laughs) pretend that he had lasers to shoot his anger. I'm not sure that that's the approach that I would take. I love your Mary Poppins voice you're taking with this. (laughs) If I were to ask you this question at 11 o'clock at night, (laughs) there would be so much profanity. If you were to ask me this question with the microphone turned off, yeah. (laughs) I say this because I think so oftentimes when we come up with these solutions, we really have to make sure that the solution that we're offering, the plan that we're offering, and she says she didn't even get a plan, is really targeting what we're trying to teach. So teaching this boy who has such a difficult time talking about his emotions or recognizing that he doesn't have to be perfect, et cetera, et cetera, giving him lasers to shoot his anger, for one, I don't even really see this as anger. Well, not only that, what skill does that teach? Right. Like you're supposed to get rid of your anger. I mean, that's the exact opposite of what we're trying to do here, that you're supposed to take out lasers and shoot your anger. Sounds like he has right now a very conditioned response, a very habitual response. So sometimes it helps when parents can just look at this as this is kind of a habit. It sounds like the mom is saying when he makes mistakes, he can't handle making mistakes, right? So that brings us back to this rigid and this perfectionism is to really talk to him about how he tolerates making mistakes and how he can handle making mistakes and that he will have feelings about that. But what he's saying when he says, I suck, that's not a feeling. So think of it in another context. Say you were really upset with your partner. You're really upset with your spouse because they forgot to do something that was really important. And you wanted to say to them, you know, I really felt disappointed. I really felt like you didn't think that this was important to me. That would be expressing your feelings. But if you said to your partner, you suck, he is saying something, I suck. We've got to expand on it. It's not about offering that reinsurance, not about saying you don't suck or it'll be fine or you'll be okay. You can say, I really love you. And this is a habit we're trying to break. I actually think that he's absolutely old enough. I'm trying to think of the age. Would my daughter or son would behave in a way that wasn't civil? Mm -hmm. I would say, I want you to imagine daddy doing this and me doing this. What would you think? So I do think that he would understand that if daddy didn't load all the dishes and I just said, you suck, Mm -hmm. he would say, well, you wouldn't do that. And then unpack that. And then what would mommy really be trying to say? Yeah. And that's where that emotional bingo is kind of helpful. It's like, yeah, 
I'm disappointed you didn't do this. And to really help him understand that the way he's thinking about his emotions is a habit that's not getting him anywhere. Right. And if we talk about it in terms of anxiety, right, his worry is showing up. He makes a mistake. What do you think your worry is saying? Your worry is saying, you'll never figure this out, or you're going to make a mistake, or you have to be perfect, or this is terrible. And then it comes to, well, then you suck, or I suck. Yeah, we just want to keep giving him the message that it is okay if he makes a mistake. That's what we want him to hear. It's okay if you make a mistake. It's okay if you don't feel good when you make a mistake. It's okay if you like, oh, I made a mistake. And then how do we move forward from there? And really talk about it as a habit, really talk about it as a pattern that he's in and that we really are going to expand the way that he can talk about this and experience this. Mom, if you're listening, if he says, well, I don't know how to do that, then you offer him some of that language. You say, when I make a mistake, sometimes I think, oh, I suck. And then other times I think, well, you know what? A lot of people make that same mistake. Or sometimes I think, well, mistakes are a part of learning. And sometimes I say, I'm not going to listen to that part of me that is so quick to tell me I'm I'm not going to listen to that part of me. Like when I backed my son's car into my other son's car (laughs) in the darkness of the morning, I'm pretty sure that my first thought was, I suck. Um, But then I said, you know, that I had a little talk with myself. I'm a human being and it was dark and I et cetera, et cetera. And I came in and I told my son and I got it fixed. And your 22-year-old son handed <laughs> you his emotional bingo card. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right, right. And said, I'm right. really disappointed in you, yeah. mom. Yeah. So I made a mistake. I felt bad about it. I was embarrassed about it. I wish that I had looked more carefully. But I didn't come to the conclusion that I was a horrible person. I came to the conclusion that I was careless and that I didn't pay attention. I didn't come to the conclusion that I'm a horrible person. And that's what we really want to help him ferret out a little bit for sure. For parents who feel like this is really resonating in their household, we did an episode January 8th, 2021 called Helping Kids with Shame and Mm Self-Harm. Similar patterns in that family and this family. The son was a little bit older, but I think that in conjunction with this one, it'd be a really great episode to re-listen to Mm -hmm. or listen to it for the first time because the self-loathing, the self-shame, the self-harm, it's really a pattern that, of course, is so distressful to parents. Yeah. I mean, I hope that as any mom who's gone through this, any parent that's gone through this can hear from me, really importantly, is that it's not uncommon. Don't go down that path of sort of like, oh, they hate themselves or oh, this or that. This is a pattern that shows up. It's really helping kids tolerate when they make mistakes and really helping them be more flexible with themselves and more flexible with their emotional expression. And if you can think about it in that way and stay out of that debate you're really going to get through this. If you're a parent who's got this pattern in your household, what behaviors should you be thinking about that you're modeling or your partner's modeling? Yeah, I mean, it's that perfectionism, right? It's how do you handle mistakes? If you make a mistake and you beat yourself up, if you look at yourself in the mirror and say, oh, I am so ugly out loud, If you don't have a way of talking through things when you are disappointed in yourself and you are beating yourself up, that's one thing to really pay attention to. Also pay attention to how you talk critically about other people. So it might not be talking about critically about people in your family, but if you are somebody who dishes out a lot of criticism, if you tend to lean toward the judgmental And the way that you talk about other people, if your children hear you gossiping in a way, if negative connection is something that you're aware of, that when you're with friends or family, that you really sort of gang up and talk about people in a negative way, what your kids hear is that you will judge them for their mistakes. What kids can hear is that you expect people to be perfect. So really pay attention to anything negative that you say about yourself, or if there's a constant stream of judging of other people. Okay. So say you do that Mm -hmm. and you realize there is a connection and you want to sort of really holistically tackle this. 
what do you say to your kids about those behaviors and your efforts to shift them? Mm -hmm. So you start off with, you know, I've noticed something and I am noticing that you are really hard on yourself. I've noticed that when you make a mistake, it is really hard for you to tolerate that. And I've been paying attention to the way that I deal with mistakes. I've been paying attention to what I say to myself, what I say out loud, what I say to you guys, what I say to other people. And I think as a family, we all have to work on widening the sweet spot. It is okay when people make mistakes. We can be disappointed. We can be frustrated. If you drive into my car and rip off the side mirror, it's totally fine for you to be disappointed in your mom for doing that. But let's all work on being less critical of mistakes, both with ourselves and with each other, because I think I do that. They might look at you like, okay, or they might say like, yeah, mom, you do. Everything has to be perfect with you. I mean, sometimes kids will give it right back at you and you got to absorb that. You got to hear that. You'll feel defensive. But start off the conversation with, you know, I've been noticing. I think that's a really good way to sort of bring these family patterns into the light. I was at a conference where I met a lovely new friend who I think now is listening because she started listening to the podcast. Oh, hi, lovely new friend. She had a history of emotional reactions. So I was like, you got to listen to this episode and this episode. And one of the things that I, I said to her, she said, oh my God, I'm listening to this. I've made so many mistakes. I said, wait, wait, wait. Then you got to keep listening. Listen to find the sweet spot in parenting because the point is none of us get this right all the time. Right. We just have to know when we realize we've gone down a road that hasn't been serving us, we do that thing. I've been noticing. And then you (laughs) turn the car around and you go in another direction. And that's the best we can do. That's the best we can do. And what you're modeling for your kids when you do that is that we're always making adjustments. We're always works in progress. We're always figuring out things. It's okay. Right. It's not about perfection. It's about awareness. It's about owning your stuff. And then helping your kids give them the skills that you're working on too, right? This is what we're working on. This is how we grow. This is how we parent. This is how we have good relationships. So Lynn, did you watch the show that I sent you on Netflix? (laughs) Yes. I think it's called Am I Old Enough? Or just old enough. Old enough. Yeah. Oh my God. Yeah. So if you don't know what this show is, Robin sent me this thing. She said, you have to watch this. So I watched it last night. So the premise of the show, it's like a reality TV show in Japan. And they send toddlers to run errands. Like two-year-old, they're wearing diapers. They're wearing diapers. <laughs> and this little two-year-old is walking a kilometer to the grocery store and back by himself. His mom even made like a flag for him to cross a busy street. <laughs> yeah, that was the best part. Of course, it's there's subtitles, but the narrator says, now's the time when he will use his yellow flag to cross a very busy street. It was like a four-lane highway in this little toddler. <laughs> With like a soggy diaper, (laughs) puts out his little flag and then walks across the street. And the narrator says, magically, the cars stop. I was like, oh, my God. Oh, my God. It was so funny. You have to watch the one of the little girl who goes to the vegetable garden. If you haven't seen that episode yet, because that one to me was not only about how we really our American culture underestimates how capable children are. Yeah. And to see the diligence and persistence this problem solver at three or four is. Yeah. It really resets our perspective on American parenting. (laughs) It does reset it. But let's be clear. There's a road in in Concord. There's a road called Loudoun Road. It's like you said, for those of you who live in Concord, it's like I sent my toddler down Loudoun Road. I mean, it really, I was just like, oh my gosh. No, of course, there's like cameramen there too. So There is an adult around them, but... Right, the cameramen are following, but they're not interacting. Right. And the kids are young enough to know, like, I don't know those people with cameras, so they don't interact with them either. Right. But it is interesting because the book Free Range Parenting, the woman who wrote that, and the whole premise was that she let her, I think, nine-year-old take the subway in New York by himself. They lived in New York City, and he wanted to see if he could get from point A to point B by himself. So they made a plan. He figured it out. She wrote an article about it. And people lost their minds. I feel like sending her an email saying like, have you seen this show on Netflix? Because it's something. That's actually the challenge. If you're an American parent, you say, that's a pretty interesting exercise. Yeah. 
Children's Protective Services will be called on you because that's our cultural response. Yeah. I can't tell you how many times I have actually been in situations where I have seen it's always an elderly person yeah. calling on a mom. It, it hasn't been me, by the way. Yeah. But I've seen people be called on like because the child is napping in the car and they literally ran in for like five minutes and back. Yeah. And it, granted, I'm not judging whether or not that was the right thing for the mom to do. But I am judging that that wasn't the right response for that elderly person to do. Yeah. I was driving home this morning up my street. And, at, and when I'm coming back home, kids are walking to school. And I was just noting in my head, there were little kids walking by themselves. And by little, I mean, they're like third grade. And I live in a very residential area. There's always a bunch of kids that are walking and there's a parent right there with them. And I just was noting that. I was just saying like, look, these little kids, their mom said, off you go, or their dad said, off you go. And these little kids, there's a mom, there's a dad right there with them. I just was noticing that this morning. My bestie and I just took a vacation with our youngest kids. Mm -hmm. We went on a Disney cruise and the kids are in the same grade. They're 11 and 10. That was the greatest vacation on autonomy development because on that ship, we gave them complete free reign. They got to go to the dining room by themselves one night. They were completely in charge of their own schedule. That was a place where I wasn't going to have CPS call on me, right? where I could enact that. And that was such a fabulous vacation for my son and my friend's daughter. They had the best time. It was a place where we could give them that independence without some sort of fear of some sort of cultural backlash. Yeah, what a great experience. We used to go to this beach resort in New Jersey when we were little. For years and years, every year we took the summer vacation and we had this little posse of friends. We pretty much had free reign. It was so cool. We used to walk around and we'd sing songs. The funny memory I have of that is that one summer we were really into the song Afternoon Delight. <laughs> I loved that song. <laughs> um, yeah, so we were like seven and eight and nine and we were just thinking, are you working up in that? <laughs> looking for it. We had no idea what it meant. The, the adults must have been like, OK. I know, yeah. No kid knew what that meant, but every kid loved that they song. Loved it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> So they should teach it. I think that should be, wouldn't that be great if that was like a third grade spring concert song that some, <laughs> some, <laughs> some, some music teacher just like, all right, everybody. Okay. Afternoon delight. Hmm, thinking of you working up an appetite. Yeah. I'd love it. If I were a music teacher, I would definitely have that song in my third grade spring recital. <laughs> So join the Facebook group so that you can ask Lynn your question on an upcoming episode. Thanks for joining us on another episode of Fluster Clucks. Bye, Robin. Bye, Lynn. If you like this show, there's a decent chance you'll also enjoy the Shameless Mom Academy. Hi, I'm Sarah Dean, the founder and host of the Shameless Mom Academy. The Shameless Mom Academy is a podcast for moms that centers moms more than it centers your kids. I'm not going to teach you how to make baby food or how to make your three-year-old or 13-year-old stop having tantrums. Instead, I'm going to bring you back to yourself. For the last 20 years, I've been helping moms through growth and transformation. Inside the Shameless Mom Academy, I help you identify who you are and who you are becoming. Look, motherhood is hard. It brought me to my knees many times and sometimes still does. Returning to who I am and who I am becoming allows me to decide how to show up in all those sticky motherhood moments, but also in all my other relationships and in all the ways I show up in my various communities. So come check out the Shameless Mom Academy wherever you listen to podcasts. I'm willing to bet you'll leave feeling a little inspired and maybe even completely fired up. And you'll probably laugh a few times because I promise we never take ourselves too seriously over here. With 700 episodes to choose from, you're likely going to find something that sparks and speaks to you inside the Shameless Mom Academy.